Hey folks, this is Todd Colburn with your Aerospace Structure Series. This video is on buckling of cylinders. We're going to find it's quite similar to what we did for flat plates with a few little twists. Let's see how it works. So there are a number of cylindrical structures or structures that can be idealized as cylinders. Many rocket and missile parts fall into this category. The fuselage of most aircraft fall into this category. And this will allow us to utilize some of these principles for all these kinds of structures. If we classify our cylinders, we can classify them as short, intermediate, long, and very long. Short cylinders are so short that the curvature looks really large relative to the length of the cylinder, and these tend to behave kind of like flat plates. If they're super long, then the out-of-plane bending stiffness will be lower than the uh, buckling effects of the cylinder itself, which will mean that they will behave like an Euler column. Anywhere in between, we can get various levels of uh, combined effects where we're going to see a sinusoidal uh, pattern. We can uh, kind of learn a little bit by looking at these two pictures from E.F. Brune's text. The one on the left, both of these are cylinders in compression. The one on the left is uh, uh, with no internal pressure, and the one on the right is with internal pressure. We're going to see later how internal pressure tends to improve our buckling allowable so that we buckle at a higher number, so we can withstand a higher compression before buckling. And that gives us kind of, that's kind of hard to see in this picture, but gives us that kind of a better, more stable looking uh, structure with uh, a sharper or tighter wavelength on the buckle. Here's another set of pictures for with and without pressure, the one on the left being bending without pressure, and the one on the right being bending with internal uh, stiffening pressure. Okay, so let's see how it works. Um, what we're going to find is first, we're going to follow almost the same idea as we had for flat plates. Remember what we saw for flat plates was we had this equation for the buckling allowable, where we had to get the coefficient, we had to be careful about what our B dimension was, whether it was the length or the loaded edge. If we have a cylinder, we're going to use a similar equation. We're going to see, once again, we're going to need a buckling coefficient, and we're going to be using the length now for the, uh, the dimension, the characteristic dimension, the thickness and the length. And this will be our equation. So the key will be to find the appropriate buckling coefficient as it was before. Except when we look at the theoretical solution for this, we're going to get a polynomial kind of like this, where m is the number of half waves. And we can actually find that it's related, the k, or the buckling coefficient, is related to this parameter 4 square root of 3 over pi squared z, where z is a new parameter. We're going to call it uh, uh, it's the geometric parameter for buckling of cylinders when we have curvature. We're going to use this similar or same parameter for both cylinders. And next lecture, we look at, at curved panels. Curved panels are curved panels which don't go all the way around. If we have a cylinder, then the whole circumference is a cylinder and with no stiffening between, just at the ends are, it were stiffened. A, uh, panel will be one, a curved panel will be one that has other stiffening like a semi-monocoque structure. So this parameter z is what we're going to be using to characterize our buckling performance of cylinders and eventually curved shells as well. We're going to use this L squared over the radius of curvature, thickness, 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared, square root of all that. That's our parameter z and we're going to be using that to find out the K. Now, the K for a, a cylinder compression can be written this way, 4 square root of 3 over pi squared. We're going to actually get a more precise set of values from tables in a moment, so stand by. But basically, what we need to take away from this slide is 
We're using the same form of the equation. We're using L rather than B, and we're using a K for the cylinder itself, which is going to account for the loading and the and constraints. Okay? All right. So if we have a cylinder under compression with no pressure, we're going to use this curve. Now, this little no pressure is a little bit of a misnomer because actually, if we have a cylinder loaded in compression, we're going to use these curves no matter what, whether we have pressure or not. It's just if we do have internal or external pressure, we're then going to modify our result. We're going to get the allowable buckling coefficient for compression by itself. So that we're actually we're going to follow that same approach for all cylindrical analysis. We're going to uh, stability analysis. We're going to first get the coefficient for the loading and end constraint. We're then going to calculate the buckling allowable for that loading. And for each kind of loading, whether we have compression or bending or shear or torsion or pressure, we're going to get the independent buckling coefficients for each. When we're done with that, we can write stress ratios and margins of safety against those if those are the only loads that we have. If we have combined loads, we'll see at the end how we can put together a margin of safety using interaction equations, which means we're still going to treat each of these effects independently before we put them together. So coming back to where we're at here, if we have a cylinder and it's loaded in axial compression, we're going to use these curves. You'll notice the difference between these curves, and in my handbook, these are on different pages so you can read them better because it's already hard enough to read. The way we read this is we look and we say, okay, we've got a, a cylinder, therefore, and it's under compression, so we come here. Now we're going to come up with the R over T ratio. What's the radius over thickness ratio? If it falls from 100 to 500, is that what that says? 500 or 600, then we're going to use the upper left curve. If we have 500 to 1,000, we're going to use the upper right curve. The lower left curve, if we're 1,000 to 2,000, and if we're over 2,000, we use the rightmost curve. Therefore, we're going to enter that R over T on the appropriate curve. We're going to take R over T. Uh, to find the curve. Then we're going to calculate our Z, which means we take the length of the thing, the Poisson's ratio of the material, the radius of the cylinder, and the thickness. We'll come in here, and that should be the mid-plane radius, although sometimes these are large and we can ignore which one of those it is. We're going to come in here with the Z parameter on the appropriate R over T curve. You'll notice there's two curves here. One of them is the recommended design curve, and the other one is the theoretical curve, and you can see the data falls kind of between. We're just going to use the lowest of these. So we're going to come on here. We're going to find the R over T, picks our curve. We're going to come up with our Z parameter and read our K for compression from the appropriate curve. We plug that in with the length of the cylinder, and we have the buckling allowable. If we only have compression on the thing. We can then write our margin of safety by that allowable divided by the compressive stress minus one. If we have combined effects or more loads than one, then we will write a stress ratio instead, which is the compressive stress over the F critical, and then we will save that to combine with the other effects in, uh, afterwards. Okay. So here's our approach. We're going to determine R over T. We select our curve, compute RZ, read the KC, and then compute FCR. We already said all that. Got it? This is where we're going to do most of the work on these four curves when we have compression. However, if we have a uh, cylinder where the R over T falls outside these limits, then we can come to this curve here. I don't recommend using this curve if we are between the range of of R over T values that we saw on the other curve. The problem is if we're off those out of that range, we have no way of calculating the, the uh, buckling coefficient. You'll notice here it's really hard to read between the different curves. That's why it's better to use the other curves. However, if our, uh, if our R over T is outside those limits, then we can use this to kind of estimate or extrapolate values outside those R over T's. That's what we use this curve for. Once again, we'll come up with our Z, 
and will read just outside the curve to the right or just outside the curve to the left uh, what the K is. And the rest of this is the same. Got it? All right. If we have a cylinder under bending, then we will come to this curve. Uh, and the curve here, basically what you're going to do is you're going to come up with your L over R uh, ratio and your R over T ratio. So you'll enter this curve with your R over T ratio, and then you go with your length over R ratio. And you'll notice, be careful, I'm identifying these to the either the left or the right. So the first one is the L over R equals 0.125, and then it's 0.25, and then it's 0.5, and so on. So you'll come in here with R over T, then you go up to L over R, and then you'll read, instead of reading K for this, we'll be reading our F uh, C R over E sub C. That means you're going to take whatever you find and multiply it by your compressive modulus to get your buckling allowable. Okay? You got that? All right. If we have torsion on a cylinder, which means it's being torqued, then we will use this curve. We'll calculate our Z as before. We will come up with Z and read the curve, whether it's a simply supported or a clamped edge. You'll notice the clamped is dashed and the simply supported is solid line. You'll read your K for torsion from here and calculate your critical buckling allowable there with the leftmost equation, KT, times that quantity. Now, if we have transfer shear, which just means a shear force, like what we get when we have a, a wind load chopping that off, then we will actually use the same curve to get k sub t, and then we will estimate k sub s is 1.25 that. Remember, when we have torsion, every part of the cylinder has the same shear stress, but when we have transfer shear, our shear stress varies from zero in a, to the max to zero in a parabolic distribution. Therefore, we're going to get a little higher buckling coefficient and we're going to use 1.25 times what we calculate from KT. So we're going to use this curve for both torsion and shear and transfer shear. If we have torsion, we read this curve directly and plug into the leftmost equation. If we have transfer shear, we're going to read this the same way, get KT and then calculate KS from KT and then use the rightmost equation with KS for the buckling allowable. Got that? Okay, if we have hydrostatic pressure, now we're going to have two cases for pressure, and these are both for external pressure. External pressure means we probably have a differential pressure. We have an internal and external pressure, but the external pressure is higher. That's giving a net crush pressure, okay? Now, if we have a net burst pressure, we're going to use the same curves. We'll talk about that in a bit, right? You cannot buckle under a burst pressure. You would just explode or rip apart, but... It has a stiffening effect, as we saw in those earlier pictures. So what we're going to end up doing is, uh, I'll teach you what to do in a moment, okay? So basically what we're going to do here is we're talking about an external crush pressure. That's the only pressure that will cause, an external pressure will cause buckling of the cylinder, can cause it. And we're going to get two curves. We're going to have one for hydrostatic pressure and one for what we're going to call radial pressure. So what's the difference? Well, in both cases, the pressure is radial. But with a hydrostatic pressure, it's as if the thing, the tank, the cylinder was sitting in a tank of water with a pressure that varies. It's a radial pressure, but it varies from the top to the bottom, increasing linearly. That's a hydrostatic pressure, like the pressure you get in a tank, right? Now you think, well, the pressure inside a tank is going to be, you know, if it's filled with a fluid, it's going to be a function, it's going to be a burst pressure. But if you have crush pressure and it's, and it's offset by this internal pressure, then you could get this hydrostatic crush pressure as the net difference, okay? So if we have hydrostatic pressure, meaning we have a pressure that changes, it's a radial pressure that changes from zero at the top to some value at the bottom, then we use this curve. The way we use it is we calculate our Z for the cylinder. As before, we're going to read our curve. We have a little variance up at the right side based on a, a, a factor on the R over T ratio. Be sure to use that so we come up with Z. We read K for pressure. We plug into this equation. Oh, this says uh, KC pi squared E over. This is actually KP, right? We're getting KP from this, and we're going to plug KP 
into this equation. Just to show you how that works real quick, since I have a typo here, is this is actually KP. We'll have to check my text. If my text has that same typo, you're going to want to mark your book with that as well. That's KP. You're going to calculate KP here using the Z, plug into that equation, and that gives your buckling allowable. Okay? Now, if you have a... Now, the challenge is we've got a... a we're getting allowable stress, and the question is, well, what stress is corresponds with that? Well, if we have pressure, remember your hoop pressure, the stress is PR over T, so you can solve that equation, plug in the allowable F critical, and solve for the P critical, and you can use this little form here. P critical is F critical T over R. So you can use this curve to get your KP, plug it into this equation to get your F critical, and then plug that into that little equation there to get the P critical, or the critical pressure, critical crush pressure, okay? If we only have crush pressure, we can write our margin of safety directly. If we only have burst pressure, it ain't going to buckle. If we have crush pressure with other loads, we'll talk about that in a minute. If we have burst pressure with other loads, we'll talk about that stiffening effect in a bit. Okay? So this is how we handle hydrostatic pressure. Now, if we have uh, radial pressure, which basically means constant pressure, top to also radial pressure, but it's constant from top to bottom, then we're going to use this equation here, or this curve here. We're going to read our Z, and we're going to read our K sub P, and once again, our K is going to be shown there. I don't know what happened with my stuff here, because it's hard to read this, but basically, if you have a Z of 20, you look in here, you're going to have a Z of 20, you're going to get a K of about 7, right? You see that? If you have a Z of 12, you're going to get a K of about 5. If you have a Z of 300, you're going to get a K of about 16. So make sure you can read log log curves. If you get a Z of 1,000, you're going to get about 30. And if you get a have a, a Z of, of 60,000, you're going to get about, what, 200 or something. Okay? You got that? That's how that works. All right. So we've seen how to calculate the buckling allowable for compression, for torsion, for direct shear or transfer shear, for bending, and for external crush pressure, both hydrostatic and constant, right? Both of them are radial. One's hydrostatic and one's constant pressure. If we have multiple loads, then we will use interaction equations. Remember, interaction equations, we'll plot our, our stress ratios, draw a line, and calculate the relative lengths, as we talked about in the first handbook in our Strength 1 class. And we'll have some interaction curve or equation that puts together the stress ratios with some kind of exponent. These are exp uh, developed under testing, right? So basically recalling that the stress ratio is just the applied stress, or whatever the calculated stress is, divided by the allowable stress and the margin of safety. If you have a single of these, it's just 1 over R minus 1. If you have these combined, then you need to do a little more work to calculate your margin of safety. Before we move into what interaction equations are used for different combined loads, let's remind ourselves what stress ratios we're going to be talking about. If we have compression, we're going to calculate the compressive stress. That's just P over A, which is just P over pi dt, right, divided by the buckling allowable under that under a compressive stress. If we have a shear stress, it's the shear stress divided by the stress ratio of the shear stress divided by the critical buckling allowable. The critical buckling allowable is the critical buckling allowable for the shear stress. If we have uh, if we have a cylinder subjected to torsion, we calculate the torsional stress. If we have it subjected to transfer shear, we calculate the transfer shear stress. If we have bending, we calculate our MC over I kind of bending stress, divide that by the buckling allowable against bending. If we have pressure, we can either write the stress ratio on the stress itself, or we can write it on the pressure. 
Okay. All right. With that said, if we have longitudinal compression combined with pure bending, we can use this equation. This is the same as if we just added those stresses together, except that in this case, the reason we need stress ratios is because our allowables for compression and for bending are different. Therefore, we need to use stress ratios to put those together. If we have longitudinal compression and bending again, but we also have torsion, then we use this equation here. Okay. If we have torsion and external pressure, we can use this equation here. And if we have transverse shear with external pressure, we can use this equation here. Now, all of this assumes that any pressure that we have is crush pressure. If we end up having a burst pressure, what we will do, the allowable is still written against a crush pressure. Therefore, our, our hoop stress, FP, is actually negative because tension is negative compression. Or we could say that our pressure is negative crush pressure. So either way, our R sub P is a negative value. If you plug in that negative stress ratio in these two lowermost uh, margin of safety equation, you will find out what the margin of safety is again against that failure mode. Got it? So if we have compression, both these stress ratios will be positive. If we have comp if we have tension, burst pr if we have burst pressure, then our stress ratio for, for burst pressure is negative, and that will end up increasing our margin of safety for any given transfer shear or external pressure that we might have. Got it? Okay. So that is how we analyze cylinders for stability. Next lecture, we'll find out how to analyze curve panels, which basically are cylinders, might be cylinders or might just be a panel, which actually have edge restraints before you go all the way around. So if you have like stringers and a fuselage, that would tend to be a curve panel rather than a cylindrical structure. Okay. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you can stay connected with the updates. Also, uh, you're going to want to feel free to like the video if you like it and to give me feedback if you have questions or comments on the videos. I'm going to encourage you to interact with those and with me in that way. Hope you found this useful. Go out there and be great. Enjoy.